Yeah. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Relative Pitch. We are so, so, so excited to be starting this journey with you all. Um, this is our first episode, which is going to be our intro and the beginning of our Wagnerism mini book club series, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on. Um, so kind of to give you an idea of how this kind of started, um, over, over the summer with COVID, everything kind of going on, we found ourselves talking a lot about music and art in general and topics that related to the world around us. And Michael was actually the one who gave the idea to do a podcast talking about everything we were talking about. And then a little bit after that, Anthony suggested that we also did a book club series along with this. And at first it wasn't a super serious idea, but then it came to become this beautiful thing that we're so excited to do. And so before we jump into anything else, I wanted to go ahead and just have everyone introduce themselves because a lot of you know us either as a group um, or individually, but not everyone knows us individually. So um, I'll start. My name is Lauren Green, as you can see. Um, I am originally from Augusta, Georgia, where I attended Davidson Fine Arts Magnet High School there. And then I went on to study music performance, specifically flute performance at Kennesaw State University, um, which is where we all met, actually. We'll talk a little about that a little bit later on. And then now I'm currently in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So just kind of jumped across the country a little bit and i'm studying i'm here for my master's in flute performance as well and then we'll just see what happens after that but <laughs> i'll let anthony uh, introduce himself now too hello everyone again my name is anthony morris um i am the director of bands and choirs at wildwood middle high school in wildwood florida um before that um, I know I'm a band director, y'all, and a choir director. Um, <laughs> before that, I originally am from Macon, Georgia. Um, so for anybody that does not know Georgia, it is in smack dab in the middle of Georgia. Um, I went to Veterans High School. I graduated from there. Um, and then I went to Kennesaw State University where um, I got my Bachelor of Music Education and with a dual concentration in both band and choral education. Um, so I graduated from there, and now I'm fulfilling my dream of of being a music director um, in the public school. So that's a little bit about me. What about you, Mr. Michael Brown? I am Michael Brown Jr. Uh, I study trumpet performance now at Western Michigan University. I grew up in middle Georgia, uh, went to Jones County High School, go Greyhounds. Mm -hmm. Then I <laughs> went to Kennesaw State, go Owls. <laughs> Started a music education major and I was like, nope. <laughs> switched to performance, found my passion, and now we're here today. I will hopefully be the comedic relief because <laughs> I don't like reading, but I love talking. Yes, this is absolutely. True. This is true. So um, now that you kind of know a little bit more about us, uh, we want to tell you about kind of like how we all came together. It's kind of like many segments and then one big thing that kind of brought us all together. And so um, I'll start with like kind of how I know them two individually. So for Michael, you know, we ha I think it was freshman orientation uh, for at KSU, and you know it's always scary. It's like who's going to be my people? Who's going to be my group? And this this guy just is like a just a ball of energy and light. And I'm just like, who is this person? Like I I just have never met anyone like him and how he just takes the room, literally, like just so literally, like just takes the room. And, you know, I just remember he gave off such a strong first impression. And I, I think later on, um, the way we really, I think became friends is it was after he came to one of my concerts, the Wind Ensemble concert. And afterwards, he, he kind of tricked me. I'm okay with it now, I've come to peace with it. But he was like, oh, you should come like to Popeye's with me, which if you don't know what Popeye's is, it's a restaurant, which I, I think it's mostly everywhere, but it's the yeah. best it's chicken ever. Good. It's pretty great chicken. And so it was after this concert, he was like, hey, come to Popeye's with me. I was like, sure, I can eat. That's fine. He didn't tell me this Popeye's was like 45 minutes away. All right. So this is someone I'm, I'm in a car with who I'm like, uh, how, did, how did this even happen? But it was such a fun time. And from that, it just like, it was so organic and natural, which I think it comes out of a lot of really great friendships where you, when you feel like 
you're together. It's not something you have to work for. It's just something that flows really naturally, which is a huge part of why we wanted to do this is because our conversations come so naturally and we bounce off of each other's energy so quickly. And so that's kind of how me and Michael came to be with Mr. Morris. Um, it was kind of like the end of freshman year. We, we knew each other. We hung in the same friend groups most of the time, but it wasn't like a personal thing yet. And we both came to, to an idea of we, we, we should get a, like a student advisory council for the School of Music where the purpose of it was to have a like a talking way to get from the students to administration in order to better the things going on in the school, have the students like, have a voice. And so the end of freshman year is where we kind of uh, collaborated on this and it came to fruition our sophomore year. Then we were co-presidents from sophomore year to junior year. That brought us together so much. It was so helpful to our leadership skills. And just like, I grew so much from working with him and our council. Mike was on the council our first, our inaugural year. And it was just such an amazing experience to better the School of Music with just who we were and as a group. Um, I will never forget that. And that was kind of the thing that really just threaded our friendship together. And so yeah. I, if y'all um, want to talk about it. Um, so when she says the last part of our freshman year, she really needs it. Like, like the last it, day. <laughs> it was the last day of our second semester of freshman year. Like school ended, I think it was May 5th. And we had a meeting on May 4th to create it. So literally on the last day. But what was funny about me and Lauren is that we had the same math class first semester where we sat on the same row. Two people were in between us and we and we walked from the same dorms, everything. But we, we just did that whole thing like, I kind of know you, but I don't know you. We see each other, but we don't see each other. And so, but that that led us then that next semester, that's where we started talking like, oh my gosh, like you do this, you do this. And we really just became such great friends over that, like that small organic um, piece of our lives. It just festered from there. Um, so, but me and Michael, we have a little bit different story. Actually, it's kind of the same, to be honest. Um, we have the same kind of standoff battle going on, except for it actually occurred for about two years prior to us coming to college. So that's a little bit of time. Um, so me and Michael were both drum majors um, in the same little area, middle Georgia, we had seen each other at different honor bands, seen each other at different music events around middle Georgia. We never said anything to each other um, until we got to Kennesaw State on our, I think it was our first week being in the marching band. And we went to each other and was like, you look familiar, you look familiar. And now we have been really inseparable since then. So it, both relationships, actually all three of our relationships have just kind of grown organically. It was never, we were put in one place and we just had to talk to each other like in a project or something, it just happened. And I think that's why our friendship is so strong and that's why it led to such beautiful art that we made both when we collaborate. Um, before, you know, coronavirus, I had a conducting recital plan in which Lauren was going to be, uh, she was gonna play flute, Michael was gonna play trumpet. We come, we always come together and it's a beautiful thing. And one of our products is Relative Pitch because we have these ideas, we care for each other, we love listening to each other's opinions. And that's really the, the fundamental of what we're doing here right now. Reminder, I just wanna put this out there. We are 22, 23 year olds, that just graduated from our undergrad talking yeah. about something big as Wagner and talking about something <laughs> big as any topic in music. Um, we are young musicians. We are just starting our career. Our opinions, again, is our opinions. This is how we are right now. This is our perception of life. And that's really where Relative Pitch come from is that it's relative to us. It is where we are in our lives. 
Um, so Michael, do you want to go ahead and add anything else about how much you love both me and Lauren so much? <laughs> I'll add a little bit. So freshman year, we were in the, what was it, Marching Owls, is what they call it at KSU. Yes, yeah, and um, Yeah, it's hot. It's real hot. In Georgia, yeah. And me and Anthony, we saw each other. We looked, never spoke. And then finally one day, he spoke to me, because, you know, I'm awesome. I did not. Um, and that's how it started. And then all that first semester, I was trying to pull him out of his room because he's a homebody, and I'm, I wasn't. Now I've turned into kind of one. I'm like a, the uncle, the old person. Um, about Lauren, she knew what she was signing up for. She knew it. I didn't tell I her how far it was. I did not tell I her how far think away think was. It was, an, oh, um, it was omitted. It was omitted information. So technically, did you lie? Depends on who you ask. But you know what? It was, like I said, it's perception. water under the bridge. Perception. Yeah. Perception. Yeah. Relative. Perception. Relative. Relative. Yeah, that's, Relative. It. that's it right but yeah it was, and so it's been a great time and i lived with anthony we were roommates for two years and it was a wonderful time just to walk two steps and we have this debate about bach or we have this conversation about little wayne's career in music or the chronic and how amazing album it was and transformative not only about classical music and i feel like that is something that will show up in our seasons and all this other stuff is not just classical music, not just this. We're, I hope, and I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about popular music. We're gonna talk about jazz. We're gonna talk about fusion. We're gonna talk about Gregorian chants. We're gonna talk about just chants in general. And because I think that's what is a new, not new because other people talk about it. That's what I think we bring to the table. And I think young people go young people. Mm -hmm. um need so you to talk about stuff so um yeah i mean literally it's funny that he said that because two days ago i get a text from michael can you give me a background of beyonce and destiny's child yes for everyone that is brand new to me i am a destiny child fanatic so i gave him a whole Super fan. of destiny child the origins of destiny child how did destiny child just really launch Beyonce to her career because I'm get, uh, I think in one of his grad um, classes, they have to do something like that. So we know we are versed in other types of music, different other types of art. Um, so this is not just gonna be about classical music. It's not just gonna be about music. Honestly, this is kind of therapeutic for all of us because the, again, we are literally on each side of the freaking U.S., okay? Michael's in the northern part. Um, sure. Lauren's all the way in sure. the west coast. I'm all the way in the southeast in Florida. W this is our friend time. So we wanted to include you in our conversation. And also, we'll really love for you to um, come into our conversation by giving us a comment, giving us a like, um, commenting on our YouTube channel, going to our Facebook page, uh, leaving a post, because we would love to include you in the conversation. So if anything we said, whether it's good or bad, we will take it all. Please just give us a comment and we would love to include you in our conversation. Yeah, so I mean, it's just, it's an amazing opportunity that we have to be here and we're super excited to start this. Um, so like we mentioned, this is kind of a, a product of COVID. Um, we, I, I can't even imagine, like, I remember in March when this was really starting to happen or when we were in here in the U.S. and we were starting to become more aware of it. I think it was something where it was like, oh, it's not here. It's not going to get here. That people don't realize, like, how many international flights come and go and come and go every single hour here before, you know, before everything happened. Um, I was, both me and Michael were actually just in the middle of our grad school auditions when all of this kind of started. I remember March, I think I had just finished all but maybe one of my auditions. So I started like late January and kind of like just went all the way through. I think I got seven. And I remember after the last one, getting the first notification, the news came on. Our first two cases, I think were in Fulton County in Georgia. And we were all, I just remember us all like, oh my God like 
it's here. Like it may have already been there, but that was when we were actually really aware. And it was just such a, and I, I'm sure they'll talk about their, their uh, experiences with it too. But for me, we're in, in the middle of like summer uh, camp and master class audition season and like concerts were coming up. Graduation was like, we were starting to plan for all this stuff. And it just, everything was just like paused. Like it just literally made it seem like the world stopped when it almost couldn't. Like I was like, this is kind of impossible. We can't just like stop all this stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we could. And it did happen that way. Um, and for me, talking to these guys like every day, even if it was texting or hour long FaceTime calls and just kind of getting out, even though we were discussing what was going on in the world and other things, just being able to talk to them about those things like together was so therapeutic at the time and still is to this day. And I think this is going to be a really beautiful thing because like Anthony said, it is something that comes very naturally to us. These topics that just kind of, we just bounce off of each other so easily. There is never a dry moment between the three of us at all. Um, and so relative pitch coming from that, I think is really beautiful. Like how something like, and people are like, has anything good happened to you during you know, the pandemic and everything. I'm like, yeah, I absolutely, I, I believe so. And this is definitely one of them, if not gonna, if it's not gonna be the biggest thing that it's come out of it for me. So I don't know if you guys wanna talk about your, you know, COVID experiences. Well, for me, COVID was uh, strange. The beginning of it, I, I'll be real honest. I don't watch the news. I don't keep up with that stuff. I'm very, you can ask anybody I hang out with. I'm very one track minded when I'm in the, when I'm in the week is teaching, performing, practicing, rehearsals. That's it. That's all I think about. I don't think about the news. I don't think about other people. I just That's all I do. So like two days before KSU shut down, me and Lauren are at a Mexican restaurant. And I'm like, this is a thing, isn't it? And Monday gets shut down. And I'm like, well, I guess it's more time to practice. And But as it developed, semester got over. I took like a month off the horn. I was just defeated mentally, physically, just beating myself up every day. And it like COVID is strange. Everybody has to deal with it in their own way mentally. I mean, still now, like I at Western Michigan, we take precautions, but we're still able to have live rehearsals with of course equipment and all that other stuff, taking every necessary precaution, aeration of the rooms but it's not the same. So it's still kind of saddening. Even though you get to hear the chords lock in together, you hear Mr. Buzzy when everything's going good. Um, it's just not the same. So it's like a battle you fight every day. It's like, oh, I get to go to school. It's not the same. I get to go to school, but I have this thing on my face. Everybody should be wearing this thing on their face, but I have it on my face. I'm not able to, you just see my eyes. So that's how my, in a short nutshell, COVID situation has been. It's been great. I've become more of a homebody. Um, but, yeah. Go team. Um, for me, uh, with COVID, um, I knew that it was around. I uh, think back in January, February, like I heard it. But it's a difference when it's in another country because you think, Oh, it does, it's not going to come here. I mean, we're in 2020. Obviously, there's a big virus. I mean, the last big virus like this, as of this, was like the Spanish flu in 1919 or something like that. This is 2020. I was like, oh, they're going to stop it before it even get here. Well, it got here. Um, and when it got here, um, and when school started shutting down, I was on a bus. Uh, going to, so Kennesaw State University's Chamber Singers um, was selected to perform at the American Corps Directors Association Southern Division Conference, um, which was uh, down in Mobile, Alabama. We were lucky enough to get on the bus and we were already going. We were already there. Um, we knew that it was still a little work. We had some uh, different, you know, people saying, school might get canceled. And we're like, oh no, like what is going to happen? Will they cancel, tell us to come back? Will they cancel the entire uh, conference? What is going on? So it really brought me and the rest of my fellow singers um, really close together because we're 33 people 
on a small charter bus, really kind of facing the end of the world or what it felt like the end of the world because every time we'll go on Facebook, on Twitter, you see the amount of people that has this virus, which is like, oh my gosh. Um, so we actually were in Mobile when we got the email, KSU is canceled. We're, we're, when you come back and you get off this bus, there's no more school. I don't have school. Mind you, I'm in my last semester of my degree. While Lauren and Michael were um, uh, auditioning at places, I was looking for jobs. I, here I am, about to graduate. I need to get a job. So I'm job hunting. Um, I also was student teaching full time. Um, the week after we would have had our state contest, um, our state festival, that was canceled. So it was something I was really not prepared for. I also had a whole recital I was planning for. That Saturday we were coming back was my third rehearsal before my, uh, before my uh, recital. That was really upsetting to me to tell Lauren, to tell Michael, to tell the rest of my friends, we can't do this. That was upsetting. And I really, I actually stopped conducting. So I'm a big conducting fan. I stopped conducting for months. Even now, the repertoire that I had uh, chose for my recital, I haven't yet went back to it because it reminds me of a very depressive time um, in which, funny enough, one of my songs is Elsa's Procession to the Cathedral by Wagner, which is one of my favorite pieces in the world. I have yet to go back and try to conduct it because it, it has that the virus has put that perception in my in my mind so it's very a little sad but i know in the future it'll come back so i'm glad that we are doing this because this is something good that came out of this i did end up getting a job yay me that also was good i actually get to teach kids and uh yes it is not the same it is not what i thought teaching band or teaching choir we have to have masks. Singers have to be so far away. Trombones have to be nine feet away. I have to be cognizant of what so-and-so is doing. Don't play inside. How many times do I have to say don't play inside to nine through 12th graders? Teachers out there, you know what I'm talking about. So it, it is very different from anything we've ever witnessed before. But good things do come out of bad times. So I'm so glad to be here with my two best friends um, doing this podcast right now. So thank you again for listening to us. And I hope that you really, really, really enjoy what we have here. Awesome. So I think we should segment our way into Wagnerism. I'm super excited to start this. So, okay. So before, before we jump right in, I think we should talk about kind of how we got to this point, like what really made us choose this book specifically and the topic of Wagner, which is a monster topic to tackle. Um, so for so for us, you know, we have these conversations every now and then where a topic like Wagner will come up. And it's such a controversial topic because there's so many different layers to this, right? You can't just say one thing and categorize Wagner. As much as you, we want to try maybe sometimes, it's impossible. Um, and so for my, I'm in a bibliography and research class here at UNM, University of New Mexico. And we have to do a research proposal. And I was like, I really wanna pick something that's super interesting to me, that I can relate to me today and also have so many different like layers and levels to it that's super interesting that I can pull different sources from. And finally, I settled onto Wagner. And I'm not exact, I'm still not 100% sure how it happened. Um, we had been talking about this book. We were eagerly waiting for this book to come out for a really long time. And while it was on my radar, it wasn't like that on my radar for me to be like, I have to do this. But something in class, I was thinking super hard in class one day and that it came to me. And so my topic, and I think I posted this on my Facebook about um, three weeks ago or so, um, but my topic is gonna be, it's called Wagner and Friends, Conservation of Music in the Age of Cancel Culture and Ethical Discussion. 
So if you don't know what cancel culture is, if you're not on Twitter, um, cancel culture is where if someone does anything negative in any way to a pretty significant degree, a, a tag or a trend will start where they're trending like cancel this person. So back in the time, back then with Wagner, it would have been cancel Wagner, you know, <laughs> like, and that's so funny to say because it makes no sense, right? To think that we are still here in 2020 talking about him. Obviously, cancel culture wasn't a thing back then as it is now. And there's a negativity with cancel culture and also something that makes you think a lot because there are amazing artists who make really terrible mistakes, right? And we can never say just, oh, completely like, push it away. Oh, they didn't mean that. Yada, yada. No, they should be held resp responsible, of course, always for the things they say, their actions, because they can hurt people. We know people say, you know, um, sticks and stones may hurt, like, may break my bones, but words can never hurt. That's, a, that's, no, that's something as kids, maybe they told us so that we would, but like, put it over our head, but it's not really true, right? Words are so, like, relevant and important and significant and even the smallest of words can change something or someone. And so this cancel culture has really just been like a thing where it's like, oh, someone messes up once, goodbye. You know, and so in this research proposal, I really want to dive into the sticky, messy subjects of people like Wagner, where it's like, okay, this terrible background, but then the ring cycle. You know, and it's kind of, you can't take them away from each other. They go hand in hand. And so it was, it was a thing that we were like, wow, this is something we're going to have a lot to discuss and talk about. And even this week, when we just read the preface of this, the amount of notes that we have just on these, like, what, uh, 15 or so pages is ridiculous. Like, we already know that we're going to be, we're going to have a lot to say about this subject. And so um, we, we've been fans of Alex Ross's for a really long time. We, me and Anthony took a class that was literally based on his book, The Rest is Noise, which was an amazing class. So shout out to Dr. Keeler. It was, an, it was awesome. I learned so much from it. And so we learned so much from it that when he like, so, said that he was doing this book, we jumped on it. We were like, absolutely. Like, this is going to be amazing. And like I said, just reading the preface, we already know this is going to be a roller coaster. So we, if you haven't like on our Facebook page and on Instagram, there's the link to this on there. So go, if like, please get it. If you want to follow, we already know a few people have gotten in and are going to follow along with us. Um, it's going to be an amazing book and amazing discussion. So um, I think we're going to start with talking about kind of like our preconceived notions, our personal opinions of him as of now, Anthony, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so first, um, I have two I, I have two songs that I will always hold close to me. Um, one is Adagio for Strings um, by Sammy Barber. Um, that song, I've always said, that will be the song I want at my funeral. I know it sounds a little morbid, but because of that anguish that you hear, that it, I've never heard the song and not cried. Like that's how much it has really had an impact on me. The other song is Elsa's Procession to the Cathedral. I remember first hearing it in high school. Um, my band director used to play different wind ensemble music as we walk in. And something about the way, the orchestration, something about the, at the last, about pr probably, last fourth of the song where the brass finally comes in the woodwinds are up in the stratosphere but it's really this longing it's literally you can hear the procession going down um that right there um has always been hard, like close to me even right now like i always get goosebumps um goosebumps listen to it I, and I've rehearsed it, I've conducted it, I've done all this stuff, but I, that song has always been very close to me. Um, but I also know Wagner's past as well. Um, being a music student, we learn about Nazi Wagner. 
like that. Like you, we realize that. And I love, I like to say that I am a liberal thinker. I am a person of, uh, of a minority. I'm a black person. I'm a part of the LGBTQ community. So here I am that says, I will always stand up for social rights. I will always stand up for that. But there is this tear in me to still want to fight for Wagner. I don't know. And I guess that is very controversial. And that's why I'm here, because I want to know more about Wagner. It, I want to finally, at the end of this book, says, here is my opinion right here. Here's why I'm defending him or why I'm no longer defending him. Um, so that is why I want to really read this book. And that was some of my pre preconceived notions. So I hope you stay tuned with me. So Michael, uh, what do you, what were some of your notions on that? So in high school, I listened to, um, I was in the Making Youth Symphony Orchestra. And uh, we listened to Wagner's overture to The Flying Dutchman, which is one of his earlier um, operas. And uh, after I listened to that, I was taken away. It's like, yep, Wagner's my favorite composer. Um, I've already listened to Mahler at that point, you know, trumpet players. So like Bach, Mahler, Wagner, I'm good. You know, that's it. And then like growing up, um, got the Berlin feel. Um, concert hall, <clears throat> first year of uh, undergrad, and uh, Sir Simon Rattle did a interview about Wagner. By the way, his interpretations are by far my favorite. I feel like he really understands, especially Mahler and Wagner, and just Germ Germanic music, period. Um, he said, and I'm quoting, kind of paraphrasing, um, that Wagner wrote a letter to Liszt while he was composing uh, The Ring Cycle, or it might have been some other composer he wrote a letter to, but he said, this is the most beautiful music that has ever been written, ever. And he's talking about his own music. Like, that is very, like, egotistical. <laughs> but... Michael has a dog named Jaeger, and we love Jaeger. The Jaeger can be Jaeger. excitable yes. at times. Mm -hmm. He heard a uh, noise and started barking, but um, he said he, most beautiful music ever written. I completely agree. Like the ring cycle is some of this best 17 hours of music that has ever been written in history, in my opinion. Um, so that's just my stance. We had, I did the history of opera class at um, KSU with Lauren and the debate came up about Wagner and should we, um, ignore his past and cancel him because of the things that he was associated with. And in my opinion, uh, his music is too beautiful. It changed the way we think about music. Um, yes, he was maybe not the best person, but um, you can't deny music. So that's kind of my two cents before we get started on this book. Uh, yeah. Uh, one thing, one real thing. Uh, to everyone listening, we are going to bring up some other controversial people that the argument that we will devise, come up with, we're going to put it against other people who are in popular music, in television, you know who I'm talking about, but we're going to see, can we separate these artists from who they are? Um, we'd love to hear what you have to say. So go ahead and do your commenting and everything. So um, stay in our conversation because we'd love to have you. Yeah, so w within this series, you know, we're not like Anthony mentioned earlier, we're not just going to be talking about music, right? It's going to be it's going to be music art, but related to what's happening in our world around us now. So that's going to include a little bit of politics because everything is politics everything is art it just goes hand in hand they've been here for the longest together they go they play right by each other's side um again we are young 21 22 year olds in the beginning of our field these are our opinions and that's why it's relative pitch it's our it's our relation our perspective of what is happening 
um, and we want to hear what you guys have to say. We really do want to hear your comments. So give us your opinions on what you think about uh, what we're saying. And uh, we, we want to hear it. We definitely want to hear it. And so, yeah, Wagner, like Michael said, we had that history of opera class, which was amazing. And the debate did come up one day about, okay, well, there are some really amazing conductors and other artists who you can't deny that those are some of the best recordings out there of these certain operas. And have they been taken down from these companies and organization sites? No, you wanna know why? Because it's art. It is unfortunately the person or people who may be the, uh, who may have um, been the conductors or the artists and everything may have done some things that are not amazing. And that's something we'll talk about later in their personal time. But when they step on that podium or when they step in that section, they, it's just, it's something, all right? It's just different. Like Elsa's, Elsa's, I played Elsa's whenever I think I was a, um, a sophomore in high school. And I think that was one of the first times where I truly felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. The ending part where the trombones goes, yeah, da, 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 da. Like, I like want to cry. All right. The first time I watched the actual opera, it's called the processional. I, my breath was taken away. Like it is beautiful. It's a masterpiece. It's, I understand why they did processional with Anthony. Like, help me on this. Like, it's... <laughs> no, <laughs> funny story, funny tangent. So Lauren actually came over, and I were, um because I was doing my research uh, for Elsa's for my recital, so I wanted to go and actually watch the opera. Um, and we, I, of course, I, I, I scooted it all the way to where actually Elsa's is played, and goosebumps, seeing the processional, seeing the bride come down. But then drama happens. And me and Lauren, because we're watching this, and it is like a, a modern day soap opera. Because we're, we're like, oh my God, what's happening next? I'm like, Lauren, did you see that? Anthony, did you see it? Like, we're, we're just going back and forth. Like, and mind you, so we have subtitles going on. So we're, we're we did not expect to be captivated by this at all. We, we were just wanting to listen to Elsa's, that's it. But soon as the song is not even done, drama comes and we're like, we end up watching the rest of that opera just because that is how amusing, how we were just kind of drug into it. And I think that's really characteristic of Wagner work is that it brings you in, no matter what, from uh, Ring um, to, to um, Elsa's, to anything that, that he has created. It is beautiful music. Now, I will tell you right now that of the three, I will most likely be the, the, the one to bring in something else. So with the arguments of can we separate an artist between the actual person. I'm, I, will, I will claim this. I will be the one to say, look, here are some people that have done some bad things. Why are we still accepting that? We are accepting them. They're part of their work, but why? Shouldn't, if they've done something, so if a person says a racist remark to me, shouldn't I um, definitely not support that person at all that's between you and your own psyche going on but the, i will be that one to say look can we is that possible so get get ready get ready yeah i'm oh, sorry michael you go ahead no you're good and I, I i will be very honest i am the one who's like <clears throat> uh Wagner's music is the best music ever written in life I wholeheartedly believe that. And yes, he's a bad person, but I'm, I'm like the opposite. So it's gonna be real interesting when we get in. That's the same thing with um, composers, 
conductors, especially the conductor we all keep hinting about. He is one of my favorite conductors of all time. And he will remain that because his interpretations are so good, they won't take him down. That is a, that is a scary reason, because he thought he was above the law, but it's a reason. And also like pop artists that do bad things, you know, love the music, bump and grind to it, but they need to be canceled because they did some bad things, but yeah. So you already see how wide of a, I don't know, of opinions that we three have just between each other. So we can only imagine what all of your opinions are. Some of you may not even be super aware of Wagner's past or because this is not just a podcast for musicians. This is a podcast for everyone. I have aunts and uncles in South Carolina who are supporter of the arts, but they don't know that much deeply about it, who this is going to be interesting for them because they're going to be like, oh, they have a fresh first opinion and they are getting hit with all this info. So it's their opinion to make out of, oh, should we listen to this? I didn't even know about his relation to that party and everything else that we're going to talk about. Um, So yeah, we we are you you see where we're starting before we even start talking about this book so some of us are believers and if you're just if you say those things and you support that then it's hard to separate you from your art then there are some of us who believe it's art like the art itself speaks for itself and then i'm that really middle ground because as a performer playing this music and like i love opera I can't deny it. And there, there, we're going to talk when we're about to start and discussing the preface of this and talking about how there were composers and other like figures in arts and politics who knew about his past and his affiliations. And they still said, well, what are you going to do about it? He wrote the ring cycle, you know? So on that note, I think we should uh, dive into uh, this preface a little bit. So just to reiterate, this is Wagnerism, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music by Alex Ross. <laughs> so uh, this is a very thick, beautiful covered book. It's amazing. Um, the, the chapters in it are they're so exciting. I'm so excited to just dive into this. Um, this preface, I think the most interesting part about the preface is that it starts with his death. All right. Like, I don't know if y'all noticed that either, but it was very like interesting to me how from the get go, it's kind of like Alex Ross was saying almost that this was a spiral from his death, even though we're going to talk about like his life and um, everything that happened. But the fact that the preface just was like, boom, he dies. And um, the, one of the funniest things I'm kind of going out of order of my notes here, but his last words apparently were my watch because his watch had fallen or had been taken he was getting sick and I think someone was trying to help him and his last words Wagner's last words were my watch and I just think that was really funny I I remember we talked about or Michael mentioned uh how I think I think it was List who he wrote that letter to because I believe was he was he married to List's daughter or was it um yeah and so I think that was right Right. second wife yes (laughs) second wife wife. and so the fact that we already knew that this man was a little egotistical he thought very highly of himself which I mean if you wrote the ring if I wrote the rain cycle I'm, I'm not going to say I, would, I wouldn't be feeling myself, you know, but it just was really funny to me because you would think he would try to make, talk about a quote from his own opera or something, but then it was just my watch. I thought just the, a little bit of comedic relief right from the, from the start of this. It just was very interesting. Um, Anthony, what, what were your opinions the first few pages of the preface? You know, I... I liked how he started with the death because mm-hmm. it showed it literally the, the title of the preface is Death in Venice. So this whole right. preface is talking about how did there's a big death in Venice going on and how did the world react to this? Um, yeah. Because we as musicians going through music history, we learn about Wagner's death or Wagner's life. Um, 
a little bit about the death part of it, but we, because we, we really study a lot of the music part. Um, but this starts off with the death and seeing what his last words. Honestly, for the longest time, I thought his last word was something prophet prophetic, like, oh, let music live or something like that. But no, it's my watch. My watch. My watch. <laughs> so that, that was very comical as well of like, now do we know why? Maybe in his old age, he was really reliant on time. Or maybe the watch was a family heirloom. Who knows? But my watch, I was like, something's a little up. Something's a little up. But one thing that I... Um, really uh, held on to was Wagner's wife. Um, she was playing uh, one of Schubert's songs that was transcribed um, by her father. Um, I, I'm probably gonna butcher this German. And also you vocalists out there, do not come for me because diction was not my strong suit, okay? But um, I think it's pronounced Lop der Tronen, uh, which means uh, in praise of tears. So the day of his death, um, it was kind of foreshadowed that that was going to happen. And um, I really, really ask everyone to go and listen to um, the song because it has this major minor type of relationship or happy, sad going on. Like something sad is happening, but there, we don't know just yet. We're still happy of life, but we're sad of the death. Um, so that really, really um, got me first, um, just reading that. I was like, wow, okay. Um, then the next thing was 5,000 telegrams went out 24 hours after his death. 5,000. Today, that would be like 25,000 tweets, 100,000 reposts, likes, shares on Facebook. Like this person, Wagner, was Michael Jackson, honestly, of his time, um, in which we never put that together. But 5,000 telegrams in 24 hours, that's a big, big popular person. Um, so that was something very interesting. Like he was what we would call a pop star. And <clears throat> I, um, my watch, it might have been an expensive one, or he's like, you know, I wear all these hours of opera. I'm, that's the only way I can keep up with it. Like 17 hours, I just need my watch. But the the big thing in the first couple, of, I loved how it started with the death. Because, you know, the reason, quote, page five. Um, but from him rises a voice that will not die. And perhaps will become in time more powerful, more hearkened to and more beloved that quote i was like the greats that is true like this quote is just like yeah we're still 2020 this was i think i believe in uh 1883 or 82 whatever whatever the date is i'm not good with that um 2020 still talking about it so yeah, I um I mean this this entire chapter Death in Venice, it really is um Alex Ross just talking about the the mayhem and the uproar that happened whenever Wagner actually passed away. The amount of yeah, the people sending letters and I think in here there yeah, Mahler, there's a quote of him running into the street when he finds out and says, The master has died. All right, this is Mahler running out into the streets saying the master has died, which is crazy because Mahler himself is a master to us, like now in 2020, like listening to his, like, and I'm sure M M Michael trumpet, so he completely agrees. Um, but it really just shows how big of an impact that Wagner had then. And the fact that we're still talking about it, Wagnerism, the, the term, it's such a huge, uh, that already, and we, there's a um, definition of it later on in this preface, but the fact that he has his own, like, movement, almost, and then, like, uh, is it Wagnerians that people call themselves, like, the fans and everything, um, it was a cultural, like, movement 
this was definitely a cultural movement and it can be applied they, they applied it to like pop culture too within it like the practices of it which is kind of crazy in here i think even the fight club was mentioned in the preface about being part of that culture which is just insane and so for for me and this makes sense because there, there were you know a lot of composers during their time who weren't recognized as the greats like they are now he was he was then and he is now and that says so much about the legacy that he had and the legacy that he still has and is, is going to always have i believe i'm just going to put it out there i don't think this music ages i think it stays um now the politics around it can change as we are seeing and can be debated but the the you can't have that big of an impact unless you are making some strong connection with the world around you and life human life and i think there's even there's an w.e.b du bois quote where he he went to, i think he even went to visit his grave like twice a day when there was like a festival or something happening and he would go visit wagner's grave and one of his quotes is the musical dramas of wagner tell of human life as he lived it and no human being white or black emphasis can afford not to know them if he would know life so that's basically saying you cannot take you, you can't say you can't relate to wagner at all is what he was saying um which is wild to me it's so wild because of the his affiliations with yes the nazi party and all those things and like just pro-germanism and all that but when you listen to that music the way we react as musicians as humans and we listen to that music and you're just like this is humanity like this is life this is something that we can relate to and that you have to almost relate to you can't just listen to elsa's and go like you something has to click in your brain you know what i mean and then if it doesn't i'm questioning something or I, it's, I, it's almost like i can't even believe it um and so that was my the biggest takeaway from me with, with this preface was just him going ahead and acknowledging all the greats knew what was going on all right and they still were like this is some of the best art that we will ever have ever and we can kind of talk about that michael was saying earlier we're, we're kind of not saying the person we are talking about we're referring to when we're talking about conductors and don't want to be sued don't want to be sued yes but you know you know or just message one of us you know who we're talking about but there were things obviously maybe people saw it happening before it came out to the public eye but they were they were willing to kind of look over it because of the art that said person was making with said organization all right it was kind of the same thing i kind of saw it there were parallels with the fact that they were composers and conductors all these other like um figures who praised wagner's music and like went to it watched it performed it and they knew what was going on right and it still happened so that just speaks of itself the power that music can have when it's something that gives back my thing with Wagner, and i think i mentioned this the other day we were talking about notes is that it would be different if it wasn't the ring cycle okay it's something that to this day still gives us something therefore it's still relevant there's some we you hear it on the radio there are pieces there are not pieces but there are songs that come and go and you're like i will never in a few years i will not even know this song is a thing because it doesn't have that lasting effect it doesn't connect to us the way that this wagner's music does and i think that is why it's such a controversial debate is because we're like can't we can't you cannot cancel wagner you or at least you cannot cancel wagner's music and his legacy and the effect that he has had um and so that's that's my stance on it that's where i kind of what i kind of took from this and there is more there after the death the death comes right at the beginning of the preface and then it more it talks about the like the composers and other political figures who kind of come in and their reactions to it um but then it starts getting a little political all right 
we get to the memorial service. Um, and I don't know, Anthony, that's what you were about to mention. <laughs> yes, I'm going to play my role exactly right. Because, yes, um, the big thing of separating an artist from their art. Um, so one thing that Hitler, not Hitler, Wagner um, has really, his name has come as what we would call it now is Hitler's Wagner, because Hitler used Wagner's music, the Nazi party, the Bolshevik uh, party, both used Wagner's music as like pro anti-Semitism, uh, you know, all of this fascist, everything going like that. And in the book, um, it says Hitler's Wagner in recent decades has uh, been a necessary corrective to silence that Wagner rights long maintain, whether because of lingering Nazi sympathies or because of simple wish to avoid the subject. Now, this brings another argument and it could literally be related to today with Black Lives Matter movement and every other social movement going on silence is not the answer um even in the preface um early in it um after uh, um after a protest um one of the jewish alumni of a fraternity that they were a part of he started protesting the um the the uh fraternity and one thing that hit me really hard because he said this for if one does not audibly protest against actions of this kind referring to the blatant racist comments that they were saying uh, at this fraternity um, function. Um, he said, one is bound in solidarity to them. Silence gives consent. That is strong. Because if you say silent on something that is bad, say you were staying silent on Black Lives Matter through, throughout what happened throughout the summer and what's still happening, I mean, um, so I want to bring all of this in, but uh, Breonna Taylor's, her, um, her office, the officers that obviously killed her, um, some got some indictments, some didn't. So this whole injustice is still going on. And if you are silent and if this does not enrage you, then you are kind of the problem. And this goes to the same thing with Wagner and his followers. If you are silent, if you do not go ahead and acknowledge that Wagner did support some anti-Semitism movements going on, if you're not going to acknowledge it, then we look at you and we look at Wagner as, I don't know, that, that, that some ain't right, something ain't right. And, we, and it does say silence, silence gives consent. So you're consenting to something horrific as racism, as prejudice, as anything like that. And I'm sorry, that's not the world we should be living in. So it is hard to separate an artist from their art when it is something of this magnitude. Yeah, I, I mean, that's Silence, silence is violence. I kept seeing that on people's signs, you know, protests going around, silence is content, uh, consent. And it's very true. You, it's, if you see something and you choose not to speak on it, it's, and there's so many, there's so many roads you can go down this. It's, well, I was protecting myself or, oh, the, you know, I don't know what this person would say about it. I don't know about what my job would say about it. And honestly, over the summer, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, anyone who has anything to say about, anything negative about what we're talking about with wanting to progress these movements and just talk about how social injustice is a thing, if you're going to get offended by it, we should, probably shouldn't be hanging in the same group anyway. And I, I, and I, unfortunately, that's kind of just some things that happen is I'm like, I don't understand how you could find anything in this movement to be negative when it's a, literally a progressive movement. We want to move forward. We want better rights for people in general, healthcare, like legal actions, uh, all of these things. It's kind of, it's baffling, you know, and we have this, we, we're very different people in this group, all right? 
Like we have very different backgrounds. And so we are always talking about this stuff because it affects all of us in very different ways. Um, and so, yeah, I, I it, we're going to be relating a lot of things to what's going on because it's so in your face. It's very in your face and it's going to be because it's in our face. It's not something that we can turn off or not think about. It is a relevant topic to us personally and going on in our world. Um, but yeah, it's the, I, one of the biggest things about this preface that I remembered is how one of Wagner's memorial services, I believe, kind of turned into a pro-Nazi, pro-German, like anti-Semitic um, rally. Oh, that word, rally. And I was like, well, if that ain't familiar, um, and there are people who are always going to say, well, that person wasn't the one who started it, but your followers are a pretty good representation of who you are. Correct. Like, I, I, I think like my friends and the things that I choose to like follow, like watch and like participate in are a very good, uh, structure of what, who I am as a person, right? They are good contributing things of who I am as a person. So. I'm not going to have Nazis or racists in my circle. Why? Because that ain't, that's not who I am. So how would that make sense? So if you find yourself being around these people or these people being at your rallies or political events, what can I say? Did I, did I hit the nail on the head without yeah. saying it? All right. And because at these rallies where things go on and again silent is consent you're consenting to what is going on and expect and i mean it's it was Wagner's memorial so obviously he's dead but the fact is his followers were already comfortable in doing this so that makes me right now remember my opinion right now in my head it's like well this is because before he died he either ha said some things that have gave that gave his consent of that, um, so his followers thought that that is okay. This is how he thought, and that we are are saying these on the on his behalf. That is what makes me give you the side eye. Like your followers are doing this because you let it be okay for it to be said, and no one said anything. I mean. At this memorial service, you had everyone from uh, German nationalists to Jewish um, um, Viennese people who were studying music. And what I was referring to um, earlier about uh, the Jewish alum um, that protested this memorial service, um, he, he was a fan of Wagner. He actually later said um, uh, he, it did not discourage him. He's a Jewish person but it did not discourage him. He said, only on the evenings when no opera was performed did I doubt the rightness of my ideas of listening to Wagner. He, no matter what, he still listened to Wagner, but it was the people. So my question, and this is my question from uh, until we get down with this book, are we um, really going after Wagner or are we going after the followers of Wagner that have perpetrated this idea that Wagner is this bad person because of the people who follow him? So is it the following or is it the person? It could be both, but that is what I want to see through this. And piggybacking off of that, um, I have like some, right now, cancel culture is a thing right? There's also cult following culture, I call it, is when people are just die hard following these people. And sometimes they don't even know these people. Or sometimes they just like, oh, my friends do it. And there's some people there's I think it was in the book somewhere hasn't listened to Wagner at all. I'm a Wagnerite. Period. And that's like, okay, but then you have on the other side. Um, I believe if I get this right from history class, um, Hitler required all of his officers 
to listen to Wagner and regularly attend his operas because of how complex they were. We don't know if Wagner wanted that. Music people, we study it, but we forget music people. Um, some of us have elitist minds. We forget that music is music. People go, yeah. Hitler used it as a resource because he knew how complex it was. Did Wagner want Hitler to use it as a resource? We don't know. So, and that's where I get where I'm like confused in my brain. Like I never knew the background of Wagner growing up in high school until undergrad. And cause I, I didn't care. And also I didn't do research. And also there were not like at the same time, like Nazi Germany was not when Wagner was alive. Now, yes, was we, we were just talking about this a couple of days ago and he was anti-Semitic. He was not a Nazi. So when people call him Nazis, I get a little upset because that was not the actual thing at the time. But I'm also big on very, like, very clear words and clear labeling when we have labels and clear words for history about it. Like, that's just a big, like, in my brain. It's just, like, cannot compute. But, like, that's another thing. There's cult followings. Cult following was after Hitler. Like, horrible person was able to get a whole country to rally around, rally around him, which is... I don't understand how history still doesn't understand how, but that's where I get like my little brain is, was it a cult following that made this certain aspects of Wagner rights was like, this is what Wagner was, or was it the people who never listened to him or was it actual people who listened to him? Like that's my whole thing. And hopefully the book will help us decide that. Yeah. Um, on that, like, I really, th I think we have really the, the same conflict of, is it the person or is it the following? Yeah. Which one is it? Um, and the thing is, I think with the English language, because I know for me, um, and I try my best, uh, when you say anti-Semitic, the thing you automatically go to is Nazi because that is what their their platform really was was they were anti-semitic against Jews Jews are the absolute worst everything like that so I think when people call Wagner a Nazi it's anti-semitic is a long word Nazi is four letters therefore boom here we are yeah um so that's why when it went, because I, I say it all the time, like Wagner was a Nazi, y'all. <laughs> we know. Um, but it's not, it's not me saying like, I know that, the, yes, they are two, they are like that, that you remember when you were in elementary school, how they had like three bubbles or two bubbles and then one. Was oh, yeah, the, the Venn diagram. Yes, right? the Venn diagram. Yeah, that is what it is because. Yes, they're two different things, but they are very closely related to each other. And honestly, I'm pretty sure historic and historian can argue that anti-Semitic movements like the memorial really kind of morphed into Nazism as it progressed. So that is why that whole English language thing just gets us all messed up. So yeah, and if, if there is a history major who also plays an instrument that listens, please comment and help us with his journey because that's your expert field of expertise. Like you do history, but like that's just like the whole like Nazi thing. That's like I'm like I get it. I really do get it in my brain, but also in my brain, I have to separate it because Wagner didn't kill nobody as we know this is true but that's that's where in my brain that's why i had to se separate it like there and then kill he actually did the thing that everybody doesn't talk about or we talk about it but like that's where i'm like leonard bernstein um i just was looking at this in page oh, what was it page 10 um, when Leonard Bernstein stopped at this site, he joked that the slab was big enough that you could dance on it. Leonard Bernstein, I believe, was Jewish. Yes. Yeah. So Leonard Bernstein was Jewish. I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, Bernstein was undoubtedly thinking not only of Wagner, this is where we get into it, but also of Adolf Hitler, who, on his first visit in 1923, 
stood at the grave for a long time alone. So Adolf Hitler, not the leader of the Nazi party, respected this composer. They shouldn't have never been like, in the way we think about music, some people, that's like the president going to someone's, um, that's like a leader of a country going to someone's grave. And we're like, what? This is just a composer. Mm -hmm. Before this time, we're like, whoa. But that's like Leonard Bernstein, amazing conductor of the New York Phil. Um, he was the first person, I think, to perform Mahler um, in a country that banned Mahler after the whole Holocaust stuff. He's the first American or, conductor. Um, and first American to uh, conduct in Europe. So him to be joking about it, but he knew. It's like, yeah, this, this is some music, y'all. So that's why I mean, this book is full of debates. Yeah, I, um, I think we're going to learn a lot through this book um, about, of course, Wagner himself, but his impact that he had on the world. And also, I think that we have a lot of questions ourselves, like personal internal questions, and we want them answered. So it's like, should we feel guilty for wanting to play this music? Should we feel guilty for listening to it? How should we feel about it? And while, you know, this book may not give us the answer, it might lead us there. It might stimulate our minds to the degree where we can try to have a more solid opinion. It, it might be completely different at the end than where we are starting now. But I think the la one of the last things that I have um, in my notes and that it's a quote that I want to mention is his, Alex Ross's, um, what he's trying to say this book is about and who it's for. All right, so he says, this is a book about a mu musician's influence on non-musicians. Resonances and rever rever reverberations, that's a word, of one art form into others. Wagner's effect on music was enorm enormous, but it did not exceed that of Monteverdi, Bach, or Beethoven. His effect on neighboring arts was, however, unprecedented, and it has not been equaled since, even in the popular arena. He cast his strongest spell on the artist of silence, novelists, poets, and painters who envied the collective storms of feeling that he could unleash in sound. All right. So this isn't really a book about Wagner's effect on the music world. This is a book about Wagner's effect on the world, like the entire world. People who may not even know him being affected by his art and his creation. Poets, artists, like visual artists and all this have been in some way affected. And I thought that was really cool because I was like, whoa. This is going to be more than, that's why we're saying this is just more than a music podcast. This is more than just a music book here. Yeah, um, that really leads you to how popular this one man was. Um, and before we leave, I want to leave with this one thing that his wife, um, Cosima, uh, said in her diary about Wagner. Um, she says, he believes that after his death, they will drop his works entirely and he will live on in human memory only as a phantom. Um, Alex Ross then says, in this respect, as in many others, he has been proved triumphantly wrong. To this day, hundreds, over a hundred years later, we are still talking about Wagner we've created a whole podcast about Wagner. So to prove that he, he didn't even really know how much he was in a, a really a modern day at the time influencer. Um, so I wanted to leave you on that. And before we go, I just wanna say thank you so much for listening to our podcast. We're so glad that you were here. We're so glad we, as a whole, get to share it with you all. Um, listening, watching, whatever you do, please stay tuned because we have some good things. We're gonna hopefully get some other people in here to be some guest stars. Um, and we're gonna have many different topics. And also, if you have a topic that you would like for us to discuss, please, please, please send us a message. Um, email us, all of our links will be in all the 
belows either on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everything. It will be there for everyone. So please reach out to us. We'll love to start a whole conversation and make this a big family. Michael? Anthony, Michael, I, I have something. a question. Yes. yes. How can we find you on Facebook? If mm. someone wants to ask you a question about what you said today. Oh, okay. So you can find me um, on Facebook at Anthony Morris. That's just my name. Um, you'll find my picture, this good old face. Um, find me there. You can find me on Twitter at Anthony K. Morris. Um, and you can also find me on Instagram at anthony.morris1. Also, shoot me an email, anthonykmorrisjr at gmail.com. Uh, send me an email and I would love to get in contact. Lauren, how do people get in contact with you? Well, um, my main forms of communication socially is Facebook and Instagram. On Facebook, you can find me. Um, my page is Lauren Green, L-O-R-I-N, fun spelling. Lauren, like Lauren Green. Ah, there you go. But no, Lauren Green. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that's my Facebook. You'll see me, my profile. On Instagram, you can find me at laurengreen.com flute on Instagram. Uh, follow me if you want to hear some fun flute playing. And my uh, email is laurengreen16 at gmail.com if you'd like to send me any comments over there. And lastly, you can find me, my name is Michael Brown, on Facebook. It's very hard to find me, so I would suggest Instagram. And my name is, my handle, I I say that, is like no caps, Michael underscore Brown Trumpet. And how you know you have the right one is this wonderful quote I put in from, and you, if you can message me where this is from, I'll get you like something. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. Today is a gift. That is why it is called a present. Mm. Well, there you go. Look. Yeah, I love, that. Um, I love that. If y'all so can guess where it's from, I'll give you some money. Don't forget, we have a, um, we have all our accounts will be linked into our Facebook, our Instagram, Relative Pitch. Um, for Instagram and Twitter, it's at Relative Pitch underscore. Um, on Facebook, it's just Relative Pitch. Go ahead and um, give us a comment there as well. So there's many ways yeah. to find all of us. So please, please, please tell your friends, share this post. Uh, do everything you know let's let's make this a big family yeah and so I want to leave on one one last quote from this to, and please like this this will be fun really give us your opinions on this I believe it's a historian who said this quote there is no path into the 20th century for good or evil that bypasses Wagner what do you have to say about that let us know but thank you so much for tuning in, listening to our first episode. We're so excited to share this with you all. Um, like, like Anthony and Michael said, please follow us on all of our accounts. Give us your opinions. We love to hear it. And we cannot wait to hear what you guys have to think about the first episode. So we will see you soon. Stay safe, wear a mask, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.